what they mean. Hopefully this will help you a little bit. <clears throat> Verse 8 says, But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth, lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, uh, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful." Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. <clears throat> Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord, and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. Father, bless this Sunday school lesson. I pray that you'd help us to learn some things today from these verses. We thank you, Lord, for Paul's letter to the church of Colossus. We just pray that you'd help us, Lord, today as, as the church here in Seneca Falls to learn some things uh, through this letter. Lord, bless our time together now, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so as we continue our study here on the book of Colossians, Paul wrote this letter, of course. This is one of his prison letters <clears throat> that he wrote, and uh, it's, a great, it's a great letter, as all of his letters are, are great letters. Uh, they're, they're letters to a specific church, to a group of people within that church. So when I read uh, the book of uh, Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, Thessalonians, when I read these, uh, Corinthians, even the book of Romans, when I read these books... I realize that, yes, he was writing to a specific church, but also it is applicable for us today in our church. There's a lot that we can learn. There's a lot that we can put into practice ourselves by reading these, uh, this passage of Scripture. I, I, I believe the entire Bible we can use. Um, I mean, all of it is good for all of us. Uh, don't pick and choose what books are, are for you and what books are for somebody else. And, you know, well, that's not for us today. And... and Nonsense. The entire Bible is for us today. Amen. If the Bible wasn't for us today, God would have left certain books out. Right, right. But they're all there, every one of them. And so when I, when I read through the Bible, I take everything that I can get from the Bible. I know some's talking to the Jews and some's talking to the Gentiles, some's talking to the Church of God. We understand that. I, we fully understand that. But you can take everything that God writes to us and use it spiritually in Amen. your lives. Amen. Everything. All right, the first thing we see here, Roman numeral number one, is separate from anger. Write those two words in the blanks. <clears throat> separate from anger, verses 8 and 9. When you got saved, when I got saved, we were supposed to put off some things and put on some things. And that's what we see here in this passage of Scripture. Paul is telling us, telling the church of Colossus to put off these particular things, and he lists six of them right there. Uh, as I have them listed anyway in the notes, he gives us these th uh, things to put off. And then there are some things that he tells us to put on down there in verse 12. We'll get into that when we get down to, to verse 12. But let me give you some of these. Uh, let me, we'll put these words into these blanks, and um, you'll see that the definition for all of these words are spelled out here for you. Um, letter A there is put off the old man. Number one, anger. Anger. What is anger? Well, Webster says anger is a violent passion of the mind excited by a real, and I've underlined this in my notes, or supposed injury. 
How many of you have ever been angry in your life? Sometime in your life you've been angry. Put your hand up. <clears throat> Keep it up. I want to see who's lying here today. Okay, I think everybody's got their hand up except for Linda. She never gets angry. That's good, Linda. <laughs> oh, she did. Okay, thank you, Linda. We all put our hand up, and I, my hand was up too. Uh, we've all been angry. Now, let me ask you have you ever been angry for a, a cause, a good cause? Yes, we get angry over good causes at times, right? Have you ever been angry over a supposed thing that didn't amount to nothing, but you got angry anyway? Yeah, that's what anger, anger is. Again, Webster's, he, I like the way he put, put that. It's a violent passion of the mind excited by a real or supposed injury, something that you think you should be angry about. Usually, you don't need to get angry about, but sometimes we get angry anyway. Then wrath. Wrath is simply violent anger. I mean, you are so mad, you're punching holes in the wall, you're kicking the dog, you're kicking furniture around, you're tossing things around the room, you're so mad, you're yelling at somebody, you're, you're just, I mean, that's, that's violent, that's wrath. Um, I'll be careful on how I ask this, but have you ever had any wrath in your life? Maybe some of us have had some wrath uh, in our life, where we've gotten so mad, so angry, that you know, your face gets red, and you toss, throw, hit, boom, whatever. Grab a hammer, right, Brennan, with that computer in the office? Yeah. Where's that hammer? <laughs> he gets so mad at that computer sometimes. I'm so glad there's not a hammer in the office. I'd have to buy a, I'd have to buy a new computer every week, or he'd start buying a computer every week. <laughs> but violent anger, that's what wrath is, just violent anger. Uh, I hope and pray that you don't have this very often in your life because it can lead to the next one, malice. Malice, number three is malice, and that is to regard with extreme ill will a spirit delighting in harm or misfortune to another. Um, I mean, you're so angry with wrath that you want to hit somebody. Or again, you want to hit something. I mean, that's when it's turned. It goes from anger to wrath to malice. It's almost like it's a progression that takes place. And that's, see, you know where it all started was number one. It all started with being angry. Now, what does the Bible say? Put off these things. Very first thing he says is put off anger. Because if you don't have anger, guess what? Wrath and malice will not happen. Does that make sense? You know, Paul knows what he was writing about under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So if you're not angry, you're not going to get wrathful. You're not going to have malice if you're not angry. So it's best just to not get angry Amen. to the point where you want to destroy something or somebody. What are you laughing about over there? <laughs> yeah, I think we've done that too. I think we've all done that. You get angry and you go right to malice. <clears throat> now, I hope number four is not you, but that's blasphemy. Blasphemy. But he does, he's got it written down here, right? I mean, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy. Have you ever known somebody got so mad they started blaspheming? Yeah. I mean, I, I hear people, I, I work outside of the church, and, and I'm out, I work for the county, I work for the school district, I, I'm out there, I hear people, they get so mad they start yelling, they start swearing, they start using God's name in vain because they're angry about something or somebody. But that is an indign, uh, indignity offered to God by words or writing, reproachful, reproachful contemptuous, or irreverent words uttered sinfully against Jehovah. It's simply, it's taking God's name in vain. Uh, and I, I say this often, you have to be careful with this, this thought of, again, you know, and I'm using this just for the, the sake of making sure you understand this, but people say this a lot when they get upset or mad, oh my God, well, what have you just done? You've talk, you're taking God's name in vain even when you say, oh, my God. Amen. I mean, yes, it's written in the book of Psalms several times. The psalm writer, I don't think it's wrong to say, oh, my God, when you're crying out to God. 
for a specific person or a thing. Oh my God, help me here. Oh my God, I, I need your help. I need your assistance. That's okay. But when you're mad or angry and you're just yelling out God's name somehow for something, that's wrong. Or, I, again, I, I hear people all the time, uh, not in church, thank the Lord, but out there um, you hear people using God's name in vain when they get mad at something. I hope as a Christian you don't ever do that. I hope you don't take God's name in vain when you get angry, even when you get really angry. You have no business taking, you have no business blaspheming the name of God when you're angry. If you gotta, if you gotta do it, you, say Allah or something. Yeah. Uh, or I don't know about another person, but you know, you use use a, a Use a false god or something. I don't, you know. But you shouldn't do that anyway. You shouldn't, you shouldn't be blaspheming at all. And then number five is filthy communication. Filthy communication. That's just perverse speaking. That's what that is. Speaking perversely. I can't stand swearing. <clears throat> I can't stand hearing other people using filthy language. Um, I just, I have a very short... I have no tolerance for it. I have no tolerance for people using God's name in vain. I just don't. And the way sometimes people talk today, it's just, it's perverse. It's filthy. Um, the things we hear out there, the words we hear people using, even in public, sitting in a restaurant and trying to enjoy a meal with your wife or your family and the next table over there you got these people talking and using all kinds of filthy language and just I mean it's it it, it becomes one of those things where people think that's part of their that's part of their language now is to use it they don't think that it's bad they don't think there's there's anything wrong with it but for us that are Christians the Bible says we're not to have any filthy communication now the other thing I'll, I'll toss out at you here too to think about I know it says out of your mouth, but have you ever been sitting in your living room with your television on and have a show on or a movie on or something and have filthy communication come across your television into your living room or wherever it is you have your TV, bedroom, den, whatever? That's no good either. Some people, oh, Christians, oh, I can handle that. Okay, you can handle that? Yeah, I can handle R-rated stuff. Really? That's really good for you, huh? It's really good for your spirit. It's really good for your, for your, for your, for your spiritual, spirituality. It's really good to listen to that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah, I can handle that. Nonsense. You can't handle it. Yes, sir. It's, it's foolishness. It's ridiculous. Yeah, but the movie's a good movie. I don't care how good the movie is. It, it's, it's, I think it's, it's, we shouldn't allow our ears to hear that stuff. Period. Ah, you're just... Yeah, I know I'm 70 years old. I'm old-fashioned. But I don't think that we should be allowing our ears to hear this stuff. We shouldn't be saying this kind of stuff. It's filthy communication. Paul says it's not allowed. When you get saved, now, a lost person, okay, I don't like to hear it from lost people, but I can understand why a lost person is acting that way. It's because they're lost. They're not saved. But we as saved Christians, we should not tolerate that stuff. And then number six is lie not. Lie not. Verse nine. Lie not one to another. Seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. Lie not. We're not. Why do people lie? We're always on our kids in school here about lying. Always, 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 always. Why is that? Because we catch him in lies at times. But God is a God of truth. God is not a, a God that he can lie. Uh, the devil is the father of lies and the father of murders and killings and all that other stuff. God is not a God that can lie. We Christians are part of his family and we shouldn't be going around lying either. So Paul says, lie not. That's something that we, these six things we should put off as a Christian. The anger, the wrath, the malice, the blasphemy, the filthy communication and, and lying. Let her be there is because the old man has been put off. The old man has been put off. That's, that's part of the old 
That's part of the old you. Remember what your old you used to be like? How was that old you of you? <laughs> All right, Roman numeral number two. So we got separate from anger. And then number two is saturate with authority, verses 10 through 14. Saturate with authority. <clears throat> Who's your authority today in your life? Now, children, uh, they should know that the parents are their authority. You live at home, your parents are the authority. Who's our authority today? Is it the parents? God is our authority. Now, those of us that work out there in the world, I've got, I've got a few bosses out there. I work for the county in the summer. I work for the school district. I've been driving a bus a little bit lately, not a lot, but a little bit more than I usually uh, drive. So I have a boss there, and I have a boss in the county. And, and so those, are, those people are my authority, who I, who I work for. Whatever they say, I do it without question, without arguing. And God, I get, He's my authority, and this is His directions to me, the Word of God. And so you're the same way. When, when you're reading the Word of God, this is our authority. Matter of fact, we believe it so much, this is our final authority in all matters we say of faith and practice. And that's the Word of God. It's not somebody else. Uh, I'm not your authority to the extent of if anything I tell you that goes contrary to the Word of God, you are to obey the Word of God more than me. But if I'm directing you through the Word of God and we're doing things according to the Word of God, then yes, I am an authority figure. I'm the shepherd of the sheep. You're my sheep, and, but I'm a sheep too. The great shepherd is my authority. And so we just kind of need to think about those things. All right, the new man is to dominate. This is the new man uh, of us. Now, Paul gives several things here, and I'll just, we'll give you the words to fill in. They're right there in the Bible, so you know what they are. But uh, number one there is Greek. The Greek is a Gentile. We all know that. Uh, now, what he's saying is, whether, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, nor circumcision, nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond, or free. But Christ is all and in all. I mean, what he is basically saying is that Paul was saying, and I'm, I'm jumping ahead, but I'll come back to these other ones. Letter B there on your notes. Paul was saying that there is no distinction of nation in the church. You understand that? That all were to be treated as brothers and sisters. That's what Paul is trying to say here in this book. Um, Many times uh, when Paul wrote these letters back in those days, there was. There was these divisions even within the church. There was the Greek, and there was the Jew, and there was, the, of course, the circumcision and the uncircumcision. Uh, there was the, the Scythian, the barbarian. There's a whole bunch of people getting saved and coming into these churches. And these people that came, got saved and came into these churches made up the church. So today we would look at people from different areas of the world, uh, different skin colors, different nationalities, you know, some are in here could have some Italian in them, some Irish, some English, some German, some Dutch and French and all, whatever you got. I don't know what you got in you, but uh, we're, a, we're just kind of a, a mixture of a whole bunch of, a bunch of different things, right? That's what I am anyway, and that's what we are. But when people come into the church, we don't look at them as a Greek or a Jew. We don't look at them as black or white. We don't look at them as, as something like that. We look at one another as, hey, you're my brother. I don't care what color you are. You're my, not you. Well, yeah, we're sisters. We're brothers and sisters. So we look at people like that. We look at people as Christians, and there shouldn't be any of this division in the church. And so the Greek was a Gentile. Number two, the Jew, obviously, is of the descendants of Israel. That's what a Jew was. You, you all know that. Number three, the circumcision is, was commanded to the Jew. It was given to the Jew, the circumcision. We understand that through Abraham all the way down through. And yes, circumcision has become part of a lot of different nationalities, uh, most I don't want to get into it much, but you know what I'm saying. But it was commanded to the Jew. Uh, number four, uncircumcision. That's, of course, the absence of circumcision. And then number five is the barbarian. This might surprise you a little bit, but a barbarian was just somebody of another nation. 
Now, we, we think of that word, right? Have you ever been called a barbarian, or did you ever look at somebody? That's a barbarian. Look at the way they're acting over there. Yes, yes, we have probably done that. Now, but the, the proper definition of a barbarian is somebody from another country, another nation, not of your culture, not just like you. Somebody that's different. They have a different cultural basis in their life. They do things differently. And they would be considered as a barbarian. Now, yes, there, are, there were some <laughs> of different nations that were cruel and savage-like. That's what we think about a barbarian, don't we? We think of somebody that's very cruel, savage, don't care about life, kill them, you know, wipe them out, doesn't matter. That's what we think about. That, that, that name has, has brought about that, that definition to our minds, I think, at least to mine anyway, uh, over the years, but it was just somebody of a different nation. Again, many people were getting saved from all over the, all over the then known world of Asia there, and there was different people coming into the church with different cultures. They looked different. They acted different. They ate different. They dressed different. And Paul is trying to in, impress upon the church that there's no difference. We don't look at these people just because of the way they look on the outside. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. We should treat one another with love. We'll talk about charity here in a minute, but we, that's how we are to treat one another. And then you have the Scythian. Scythian, number six. The Scythian was of a nomadic tribe who dwelt mostly uh, in the north. Today's Russia. Remember, people were getting saved all over. And so you've got the You've got the Greek, you've got the Jew, you've got the circumcision, uncircumcision, barbarian skin. Paul was just trying to cover everybody of the then known world around Coloss because people were coming in, getting saved. He was going out preaching the gospel. People were getting saved. And I think when Paul, <clears throat> when he was in these different areas and even when he was out, out and about and, and people were getting saved, and he was the right kind of missionary. He is the, the biblical example of a good missionary. He would direct people to these different churches that he, was, that he was getting started or people were starting. So if there's people in the area of Colossus, he'd send them to the church of Colossus. Like any evangelist, missionary should be doing. They should be getting people to the, to, the, to the church in their area so they can attend and grow and learn, right? That's what we should be doing. That's what our missionaries do. They don't, if there's not a church in the area, they start a church. And then they get as many people into that church as they can. And then they start another church. Down the road, next city over, next town, next village, whatever. And so this is what Paul was doing. And so he's, he's trying to cover all these different people that uh, was, these people were being ministered to in that early church. Let her be there. Paul was saying that there is no distinction of nation in the church, that all were to be treated as brothers and sisters. And then letter C is put on. We're to put off some things. We're to put on some things. Let me stop there just for a moment and just make sure that I cover this again, and I've covered it many times. When we have new people coming into church, you better be friendly. Amen. You better welcome them here. Do I make myself clear? Make them feel welcome. Put a smile on your face. Put your hand out and shake and introduce yourself. Hi, my name is. They probably will tell you their name if you tell them your name first. Now, there won't be a test afterwards. I know you won't remember their names. And I hear people, I, I won't remember their name anyway. Well, so you don't welcome people into the church just because you can't remember. I can't remember everybody's name. I, I have my way of doing it. I look the person in the eye and I repeat that name over and over, not out loud, Hi, uh, you know, I, you know I, I don't do the Brenda, 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 Brenda. No, you don't do that out loud. But, you, you know, when you shake somebody's hand, you look at them and you say in your mind, Brenda, 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 Brenda. And then you're more apt to remember the name Brenda if you said it a few times. Then when you walk away from the person, you still think about that face of theirs and you throw that name around in your, in your mind again. So when you see them walk into the door again, hopefully in the future, you'll remember who Brenda is because you, you practice that. That takes a little work. It takes a little practice. Now, I didn't come up with that myself. Dale Carnegie taught me that 
many years ago. I had to take all these courses when I worked at Crucible. But I mean, it's a good way to know people's names and to remember them. Um, a good salesman is going to remember the person that they've sold something to, right? I mean, that's just the way it works. BJ, you, you know that. You have people working for you. You want people to, when they come back into your business, you want people to come back in and, boy, if, if your salesman, Buck or one of the others, can remember that person's name, they're going to come back to you in the future. Amen. And when we have people coming into the doors here, if you can remember their name, and walk up to them, say, hey, so and so, it's good to see you again. Thanks for, you know, thanks for coming. That says a lot, and that impresses them. Amen. And so, if you're not doing that, would you please start today? <laughs> I mean, just do that. Just make it a habit of, of introducing yourself. Be friendly. If we want to have friends, the Bible tells that we need to be friendly if we want to have friends. I know some of you, I don't want to have friends. I don't need friends. Okay. Jesus is my only friend. Oh, you're super spiritual. Thank you for that. But we as a church ought to be a friendly church. We ought to be, we ought to be the most friendly church in town, in the area. That's what we ought to strive to be. I mean, I know we have our bad days. <clears throat> I know we have our mopey days. We have mopey days. Some of you have a few too many mopey days. <laughs> Not all, not, not a, all of us. But we all have our mopey days. Come into church, you're mopey, and you, you don't feel like talking to anybody, and you, know, you almost got that sign out there, don't talk to me, I'm not talking back. <laughs> you know. But you can still be friendly. You can still go out of your way to be friendly to somebody. I'll never forget when Kathy and I started going to church, many, many, oh, this is way, 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 way back. I don't know, 50, I don't know. How long ago it was. We got invited to Temple Baptist, and they had just started the church in the Grange Hall in Baldwinsville. And uh, we walked in. I told you this story before, but my car was breaking down. On the way to the church, I'm in a suit and tie, white shirt, and my muffler falls off on 690. So what do I have to do? I have to pull over, and I got to get underneath the car, and I got to strap that thing up with some, uh, I don't know, something, piece of wire, uh, clothes hanger, I, don't, I forget. And that was not working well for me. <clears throat> that was not, it was like the devil was trying to stop us from going to church. Kathy had just been saved not, not long ago. And so, uh, but we get to church, we're a little late because of all of that stuff. But there was a lady there that just welcomed us in there. She was so sweet and kind. That made an impression to me that I still remember that to this day. When we walked into the old Grange Hall, there's, there's Carol Porter, and she is just welcoming us in with a big smile and directing us and telling us where, you know, where, we, where to go upstairs here. Their bathrooms are over here. I mean, that made an impression on us because somebody went out of their way to help us. She never, met, she never saw us before. We were brand new to the church. She never, never ever saw us. She didn't know who we were. But that made an impression on me. And first impressions when you walk in makes a big difference. Amen. If you're in a hallway and, and somebody new walks in and you, you don't go up and shake their hand, they'll re listen, listen, they'll remember that. They'll also remember the person who walks up and shakes their hand and says, good morning, good to see you here today. I'm so-and-so. Uh, if you need the bathrooms, they're down around here. The nursery's down that way. If you come on in here, this is where we meet. Blah, blah. You know, I mean... It's called being friendly. It's not just the job of the usher. Some people think that. Well, that's the usher's job. It's not my job. Yeah, we pay our ushers a whole lot of money to do what they do. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> no, it's all of our jobs, folks. To welcome everybody, and it's everybody. It's not just the preacher's, not just the pastor's job, it's not just the assistant pastor's, not just the usher's job. Well, that's not my job. I don't do that. Well, that's, not, that's no Christian attitude to have. All right, where was I? Number three, Roman numeral number three. Satisfy and abide, 15 through 17. Satisfy and abide. Uh, we see that in verses 15 through 17. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. To the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. There's that, that dwelling. Letter A there. Allow the Lord to rule. 
Allow the Lord to rule. Who's ruling in your life? Jesus Christ should be ruling your life. Amen. He should be the one telling you what to do. This book ought to be ruling your life along with the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Allow the Lord to rule in your hearts. That's what we should be doing. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Listen, somebody's going to rule you. Somebody's going to tell you what to do. I know you got a boss out there in the world tells you what to do, but we've got God telling us what to do. We are to allow Him to rule in our hearts. Letter B, the Word of Christ is to dwell in us. Dwell. How do you get the Word of Christ to dwell in you? Read it. Memorize it. Meditate on it. Study it. Read it again. Memorize it some more. Meditate on it some more. Study it some more. Just keep in the book. That's how the Word of Christ is to dwell in us. Let her see. Do everything in the name of Christ. Look at, look at verse 17. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Let me ask you a question. Can you say that everything you do is in the name of Christ? Let me rephrase that. Everything you say or do, is it in the name of Christ? Probably not. You might do some things that's not in the name of Christ. You might say some things that's not in the name of Christ. You might think some things that's not has anything to do with the Lord. But the Bible says, And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. I like this verse, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, kind of goes along with Colossians 3, 17. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do, do all to the glory of God. Do all to the glory of God. So everything you and I do, does it bring glory to the Lord? Good question. All right, number four, last here is submit always. Submit. And I, there's no blanks to fill in there. Just submit. The Bible says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. We, we all know that. You wives know that, right? And then submission for the husband. Husband, love your wives. I said, husband, love your wives. That didn't sound right. <laughs> Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. That's something that we, uh, some of us husbands have to work on at times. You just need to work on getting a wife. That's what you need. Should I put an advertisement on the, on the thing here for TJ? I would never recommend getting anything on, off eBay as far as a... No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend that either. Anyway, uh, where was I? All right. Husbands, love your wives. Be not bitter against them. Uh, then children. Uh, children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. And I, I, I've been guilty of that in the past. I think we've all probably, as fathers caused maybe some anger in our children, and it was not something we should have done. I'm not proud of that or happy of that, and uh, it's not good. Then servants. These are, the, these are our employees, those that work for somebody. Obey in all things your masters. That's your, your boss, according to the flesh. Not with eye service, not when, they just walk, not when they walk in the room or walk down the hall or whatever, and then you start working. No. We're going to be working all the time, whether they're in the room, whether they're in the area, whether they're watching you or not. Because all you're trying to do then is to be a men pleaser when you only work when your boss is around. You go to work, you put in a full eight-hour day if you're getting paid eight hours, and you work what you're getting paid for. As an employer, that's what an employer wants their employees to do, Amen. Right? BJ, yes, you want your employees working. If you're going to pay them, you want them to do something. We seem to live in a day and age where people want to go for a paycheck but do absolutely nothing for it. 
That's, that's not biblical. You get paid for doing something, you, you earn that pay. Well, they just, they, I deserve it. No, you don't deserve it. They could fire you on the spot and, and get somebody in there that's going to work. And then it says, of course, 23, and whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Heartily. What you do, even in your job. You've heard this little phrase. I've said it before. I've heard other people say it. I, I stole it from somebody. Somebody said it one day. But if you love your job, you don't work a day in your life. But I've known some people hate, hate, hate their job. If you hate your job, then find another one. But to go to work every day and hate your job, hate your boss, hate this, hate that, that seems to be the, the, the common denominator for some people. I just hate this, hate that. Good night. Are you saved? A saved person, if they have the right attitude, no matter what kind of job they have, they can still love the job if they're doing it for the Lord. If you don't like what you do, do it for the Lord, and then you'll like it, I think. I've had some weird jobs in the past. I worked for a diaper company one time, doing this to diapers. The dirty, you talk about dirty jobs? I had it. You know how much I made? $1.85 an hour. But that was my job that I had at the time, and I did it the best that I could. I shook those diapers out the best that I could. I got all that stuff out of them before they went into the washing machine. And there was nursing home diapers. They're worse than the other ones. No, we couldn't throw them out. We had to clean them. But you know what? I looked at that job as, hey, this is from the Lord. It's all I could get at the time. And I thought I was doing good at $1.85 an hour. That was minimum wage. I've had some weird jobs in the past, and then the Lord, after a while, I got to, you know, you get better jobs, and when I went to Crucible, I, I, that job, I loved that job. I'd still be there if I wasn't here. I would have retired a few years ago, but um, I just enjoyed what I did. Anything that I did, I looked at it as a, it was of the Lord, and I'm going to like what I'm doing, Amen. even if it's cleaning out diapers or collecting eggs from the chickens. I did that for four years. That's a stinky job, too. I had several stinky jobs. <sighs> Brennan knows. Brennan does that every day. It was <laughs> almost every day. All right, anyway, we're done here, folks. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we could be here today. Thank you for this lesson. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Sorry, I got a little sidetracked there. What do you do? Do you really? Yeah.